KBO sent us a Christmas present. This is their commuter bike called the Breeze. It's one of the most solid frames I've ever seen that comes in a package with pretty much everything you could possibly need for a daily driver. Oh, and it's electric. Before we jump into this first impressions, I have a question for my hardcore gas bike enthusiast. The individuals who would either never consider an electric bike, or at the very least would be hard pressed to buy one, and that's if everything was just right. After you watch a little bit of this first impressions video and you get an idea for the quality and build of this electric bike, let me know in the comments if you would consider purchasing a gas bike for the same $1,500 price tag assuming the build quality and components all met the same standards as the KBO Breeze. As you'll see by the end of the video, I'm impressed with this bike. The quality and reliability is on par for its price bracket, but if there was a gas bike option with good reputation, a solid build, and has been known to be reliable for $1,500, would you consider purchasing it? Let me know in the comments what you think. A gas-powered bike channel doing an electric bike video is something I've looked forward to and feared for quite some time. I reckon I would get triggered comments from both sides of the fence all over the comment section. But I tested the waters with a worst case scenario using an electric scooter and found out that you guys are pretty chill and freaking awesome. So I'm just going to tell you like it is. KBO sent us their breeze to do some videos on. They gave us creative freedom. And if it sucks, I get to tell you if it sucks. Uh, but spoiler alert, it doesn't suck. As a matter of fact, I was hard pressed to find any nitpicky things about the bike. So here's the deal. This is a first impressions video, so I'm going to give you my first impressions. There's about a thousand review videos on this bike, so we're going to try something a little bit different. And I'm going to tell you what I think is important to me, and what might be important to some of you guys, that's been drastically overlooked in many other videos about this bike. In my opinion, this is like the light duty pickup of the motorized bike community. It's got everything it needs, nothing it doesn't. Somebody could pull this right out the box, put it together, and do absolutely no upgrades to the bike whatsoever, no adjustments as well, and just ride it. As a gas bike enthusiast, the fanciest electric bike in the world could not possibly replace these cheap little motors that I have so much fun with. It just doesn't matter. So when it comes to electric bikes for me, they're utilitarian. As mentioned in the Varla Eagle 1 video, it's great to have them as a reliable, no fuss option where you can just jump on them and go in case those things you love to tinker with all the time are broken because they break a lot, let's be honest. But that's not why we ride them. Comparing the features that you get with the Breeze classifies it to me as the bike for people who are into bikes. Don't take that the wrong way, KBO. That's actually a good thing in my opinion, and here's why. It's not that the Breeze is lacking in style, it has decent style, but that's not what they focused on. They focused on important things, like excessively large fenders that keep you clean while traveling through a mud hole to get to work. Better than any other universal fender I've put on a bike so far. An integrated tail and brake light, along with a well-designed headlight that not only projects its beam perfectly in front of you, but has just enough power to get the job done close to the bike's max rated speed. 
a very solid rear rack that along with the fenders makes absolutely no noise when going over sketchy terrain. In rough road conditions, the bike is amazingly silent and smooth, and I have to admit, listening to the tires carve their way through gravel is enjoyable. I'd also like to point out that this rack is bolted to the frame, not welded, NKBO thank you for doing this. This is not only convenient for removing excess of weight if you don't need to use it, stylizing the bike if you want to get better looks, but it's also safer in my opinion as I've seen welded racks actually crack frames in the past. Be it much cheaper frames, I'm sure you could have done it just fine, but it's a nice peace of mind. The human side of the drivetrain is well thought out. You've got metal pedals with aggressive studs, which will stand up to anything in the commuting side as well as light trail use. The crank arms are pretty beefy. They're going to stand up to some abuse. And the kickstand is nice and wide with a big footprint and put well out of the way of the pedals. I appreciate this, and so will anybody who's ever tried to back a bike out of a room with the kickstand down. A generously adjustable seat post along with a handle on the back of the seat which is oddly convenient for maneuvering the bike around without tearing the seat off the post as I've done with gas bikes in the past. The seat itself is relatively comfortable, not the best, but I found it more than adequate for a one hour trip and I weigh about 180 pounds. Beyond that, it tends to burn a little bit. We have an integrated USB port on the battery, which I do appreciate. You essentially have the largest battery bank in the world here for charging your phone, USB speaker, a brighter bike light, or a hungry LED strip, which I put on the bike for Christmas. I don't care for where they put the port off the side here. It's pretty exposed and could be sheared off by any number of things that get a little too close to the bike. It's nowhere near your knee, so you're not going to hit it while pedaling. It's just not in the best spot, in my opinion. I would have preferred to see it on top of the battery, guarded by the frame, or even better, on the heads-up display itself, much like the Varley Eagle 1 scooter has. I do enjoy the convenience of being able to charge the battery on or off the bike, but I do not like where they put the charging port, as I almost figured out the hard way. If you are charging the battery on the bike and you roll the bike backwards, the pedals can actually shear the port right off the battery. Needless to say, that would be an incredibly expensive fix. So I would prefer to see this port, again, on top of the battery guarded by the frame and nowhere near the pedals. I've been bouncing around between the positives and negatives about this bike, but there are no deal breakers that I can find, and I'm running out of the nitpicks, so there's only a couple left. I'm just going to knock them out of the way. Being an electric bike, there's an excessive amount of wiring coming off the handlebars. I'm no stranger to a messy set of handlebars, but I would have preferred some wire loom just to clean up the bundle. The wires are nice and long though and there's no chance of binding anything up if you turn the handlebars at an extreme angle. However, I did notice that they didn't use any rubber grommet where the wires insert to the frame. I worry that over time these little movements will cause these wires to fatigue and get cut through, even though the metal is really soft where it goes into the frame. A rubber grommet would have been nice to see. I love having a throttle on the bike, thank you so much. Being a gas bike enthusiast, this was an absolute must to me, and I wouldn't have considered a bike any other way. Unfortunately, the return spring in the throttle itself is pretty stiff and strong, and I found holding the throttle position for an extended period of time fatigues the wrist and thumb. So a weaker spring inside the throttle would be nice to see. Out of all the nitpicks so far, I would say that the charging port placement is the one to be the most concerned about. But by far the most annoying thing on this bike is how the pedal assist works in conjunction with the throttle. Now, I'm not an electric bike expert obviously and I'm very new to the market but I have been doing some research ever since I found out I was receiving this bike. 
And what I can see so far is that the KBO Breeze is priced in the mid-level electric price bracket, but with high-end features, strong build quality that you would find on more expensive bikes. And the fact that you don't have to add all these accessories like the rack, the fenders, the kickstand, the lights, they're all included with the price point. And they don't cut quality anywhere on the bike as far as I can tell, except for one area. The cadence sensor, not a torque sensor. Everything I can see from riding the bike and listening to other reviews, these cadence sensors are not bad in any way. They just have to be set up properly with the pedal assist, or at the very least, give you the capability of setting your own options, which unfortunately the Breeze doesn't do. The Breeze has one neutral mode and six assist modes. The lowest assist mode is actually a walking assist. If for some reason you find yourself in a situation where you have to get off the bike and go up an incredibly steep hill, or just walk the bike through some really boggy or sketchy terrain, you can hold down on the minus symbol and it'll actually give you a six kilometer an hour assist so you don't have to push the bike. During normal commuting and cruising speeds, I found that the pedal assist by itself is great. It doesn't really matter what setting you're in, you'll almost never find yourself using the throttle, except when you just want to take a break and stop pedaling or have some fun. Unfortunately, you don't have the option to tweak any of the settings, as far as I can tell, for acceleration and top speed in the individual pedal assist modes, which is pretty unfortunate. So for that reason, the throttle comes in handy during very low speed operations. The throttle allows you to very finely adjust your acceleration and your top speed, as it should because it's a throttle. But unfortunately, in the zero pedal assist mode, the throttle is deactivated, which is pointless in my opinion. I'll give you an example which is not a niche, this happens almost every time I ride the bike. It's really clunky and just cumbersome. When I'm trying to hop over a little curve, go through a ditch, or just ride through a very short boggy bit of terrain, or even climb a steep incline, I use the throttle at these very low speeds of operation because you can control it so well and it's really fine tuned. But unfortunately the moment you start to pedal to give the motor assistance because sometimes it strains under steep hill conditions, it's only a 500 watt motor. The pedal assist will immediately start to kick in and try to jump you up to 10 miles an hour and because it has a delay when it activates and when it deactivates it's really clunky and can throw you off. Not really enough to cause an accident at these low speeds, just cause some embarrassing situations. So ideally I'd like to see the following two options or at least one of the two. A. I would love to be able to use the throttle with the zero pedal assist mode activated would really help out in these low speed operations. B, I would love to be able to tweak the settings in individual pedal assist modes, control how fast the bike accelerates to its top speed, and control what top speed is set by each pedal assist level. For me the top speed was 22 miles an hour and I can feel the motor cut out once it reaches 22 so it is obviously governed for legal reasons and it's not limited under power. I don't know of any way to unlock this bike to get a higher speed however it uses a geared hub drive motor so that wouldn't really be beneficial. Those motors are going to tend to top out at about 25 miles an hour before they become incredibly inefficient. When you're cruising between 18 and 20 miles an hour with very light pedal assistance, I noticed that the amp draw meter on the heads up display is only at two bars, which tells me that the rated 55 miles of range that this bike is supposed to be able to attain is definitely possible with very light pedal assistance. The geared hub motor has another benefit as well, is there's no perceivable drag whenever you're just trying to pedal. Whether you pick the bike up and spin the rear tire or you're pedaling on flat ground, you don't even notice that there's a motor there at all. Adjustments and quality control out of the box are the best I've seen so far. I didn't have to do any adjustments to this bike. Pop the front wheel on, both the front and back brake calipers were properly adjusted and they did not rub on the rotors. The Shimano derailleur was perfectly adjusted shifting through every single gear without a hiccup and up to the bike's top speed of 22 miles an hour it feels incredibly smooth. The wheels are true and they even had little touches like removing the plastic reflectors from the spokes and opting to have reflective lining on the tires themselves to maintain safety and balance. 
I actually have about a dozen more things I was going to add to this video, but because this is first impressions and I don't know how well the bike is going to hold up yet, it wouldn't really matter for me to tell you every single detail about this bike if it just breaks down in a month. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this bike on an adventure trip testing its maximum range. We'll have a video on that. And then we'll come back about a month later and find out how well it's held up under our rough road conditions and light trail use. For the rest of our ride today, we've been down some roads where I don't normally travel on the motorized bikes. Being able to hear traffic in certain situations on these electric bikes is a big benefit and will allow me to go on certain roads which I normally don't. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the ride and until next time, ride safe. show you guys some this building I've never been able to figure this out so you see that window right there you see the window above it the one that kind of looks like a door why is there a doorway to nowhere Someday, maybe. Someday.